Hello and welcome to Storical. I am your host, Peter Roberts. At Storical, we think your stories are historical. History is the story of you, and they deserve to be recorded and shared. Storical is the place you come to for advice on how to capture life story, tools to use, and how to complete your project. Listen to experts, memoir writers, and product reviews. Visit us at lifestoryprofessionals.com to read information that we talk about on Storical and to get free downloadable tips and to follow links and books that people on our show have written. Let's inspire you to start. Hello and welcome to episode 21 of Storical the second part of our three-part series on guided autobiography. My guest today is Heidi Thorson of Through Your Eyes Memoirs, based in Washington State. Heidi takes us through the magic of guided autobiography that occurs when participants read and share their stories with each other. Heidi has some great advice for those who need to start writing too. So let's welcome Heidi. Heidi. Hi, Peter. Great to be here. So I was wondering, Heidi, how you got involved in life story? It was kind of a fascinating journey. I'm a career teacher, and I am really quite passionate about learning and education. I've, I taught in public school for 30 plus years and spent many hours upon hours motivating students and children to to love learning. And that career ended due to medical issues. You know, it, it took a little bit of time for me to redirect my ambitions about teaching. And I came across life story writing through a colleague. And I've always obviously enjoyed being around people, enjoyed conversations with people, enjoyed learning more about people as an educator. But I, I was given the opportunity to take a training course called Guided Autobiography, which teaches people to how to help other people record their life stories. And I thought, you know, this is really great. And it was something I could do from my home, which worked out perfectly, kept me in the teaching field. And so I tried it out. I immediately had two full classes that I offered at our local church. And they filled up immediately, and the response was incredible. I approached life story writing more from the aspect of a teacher to help people learn to write. But what I found was something much more incredible. I I was I was amazed at the magic that happened when people were given the opportunity to think about their past and record information that they hadn't thought about for years. And then to, in a very safe and caring and trusted environment, for them to be able to share those experiences. Mm -hmm. And I watched before my eyes as a sort of magic happened. They affirmed each other. They supported each other. They encouraged each other. They acknowledged commonalities. They understood things about humanity that they had never understood before, all the while having a collection of their own stories. And I knew that this was really something pretty fantastic. I could teach. I could motivate I could assist people on their life writing journey and people could write their life stories and learn. So I was off. (laughs) Wow, that sounds like a fascinating journey. So you took the guided autobiography course um, with the Biren Institute? Yes, I did with Cheryl Svensson, who is now the director for the Biren Institute. And so um, through that course, you learned guided autobiography. Can you just explain what that is? Guided autobiography, it's a process of writing your life story. The process was 
researched and developed by Dr. James Beeren, who was a neuroscientist and the founder of the School of Gerontology at USC in Southern California. And he discovered what I, what we call the gap magic. He discovered what happens when people can think about their life story. But the, I think one of the big aspects in his approach was the sharing. And that's where the magic happens is when you write your life story and then you share it. So he developed a series of 10 different themes. He, he discovered 10 universal themes that are un- probably pretty standard in most people's lives. One theme is presented each week and is developed with priming questions. Say, for example, the first theme that, that students get is branching points. And so the the topic of branching points is explored in class. At the end of the class, there are 10 priming questions or questions that approach various aspects related to branching points in their life. Students then go home, write two pages on that theme and come back a week later and share that in the last half of the next class session. So it's really a process by which to look at your life. So you took away skills from that writing course to be able to set up a writing course where you are in your own home. Right. I took away thoughts for presenting in a writing class. And it was it was it was pretty fun the first time I had I been out of sure the regular what expectations classroom for the about five years. Had of that the very first class. class day when I had my first guided autobiography class, it was like, wow, this is so wonderful again to be in front of a group of people and teaching them. Now, you might think that for a writing class, participants were good at writing. But listen to Cheryl explain, although people had lots of life stories, not everyone knew how to write them down. And that's why the autobiography class is called Guided Autobiography. We all have stories, but not every one of us is good at writing either. It's okay to say, I'm not good at writing, but I still have some good stories. Let's hear Cheryl talk about the strategies that she used to help her participants get writing. People come afraid to write. I, well, I often hear, but, but I, I really can't write. I'm not a writer. I don't know how to write. And they come with this fear about, I have abundance of, you know, an abundance of life stories, but I don't know how to write them, and I'm not a good writer. And, and it's so amazing to be able to just say to them, it's okay. You don't have to be a good writer. You just have to want to write your stories down. And anything you write, it's your story. How can it be bad writing? The way you write your story is your voice. And the teacher's red pen gets put aside. There's no editing unless it's something you want to be edited. It's it's you telling the story the way you want to tell it. And that's where I got the name of my company from. My company is called Through Your Eyes because people write their life stories as they saw it, as it was through their eyes, different from how a sibling may have seen a same situation or different than how a parent may have seen that same situation. My students are telling their stories through their eyes and how they, at that time, interpreted what the events were around that situation. So how do students who think that they aren't good at writing but want to attend a memoir class, how do they get up the courage to enroll in your classes, which is all about writing? You know, you're right. It does take courage. I think it takes a lot of assurance. It's just like, it's okay. You're safe. In the very beginning of the first class, we have a, a goals and guideline, steps that we go through. And this was developed by Dr. Biren in his guided autobiography curriculum. And these steps outline that, first of all, the probably the most important one is the, the pledge of confidentiality. Anything that's shared in a room is confidential. And secondly, After each person reads their story, positive, supportive comments are made. 
not about the writing, but acknowledging what you have heard from that person, the strength of character that has come through um, in what they wrote, perhaps the wisdom for a foolish activity that they've done. We acknowledge um, the wisdom that they've gained. We acknowledge their compassion that they showed. Any, any trait that we've seen in a story, other students acknowledge that in a positive way. And the focus is really taken away from writing and put more on the life review and the, the, the acknowledging, we know that you've been through this fantastic or horrendous or scary or challenging event. And we acknowledge that, that you've navigated it and made it through. And now you've put that down on paper and writing. So kind of take the focus away from writing and more into telling your life story and sharing it. So what effect does that have on each writer when their story is heard by other people? There's just a big sigh of relief. <laughs> They're just, wow. And you just see, their, you see the muscles in their face relax. They smile. There's more eye contact within the group. There's just this calm that settles over the group as each person reads. And after the first class, people leave almost giddy, like, oh, this is going to be wonderful. Um, I, they, they just recognize that this is a place they want to be and they feel safe, they feel comfortable, and they are ready to jump into writing their life story. It's almost the kind of feeling that one gets after a really strenuous athletic workout. You have this kind of peace and, and energy that comes over you from the re release of endorphins. Mm -hmm. That same thing happens after one of these memoir classes. So your class is full of people, I imagine, who have never ever met each other before. They're total strangers. I'm interested in how they can connect to each other, given that they don't know each other at all. <laughs> that's a really interesting question, and that's probably one of the most fascinating things about this class. You're right. Nobody knows each other. And I don't know what kind of combinations of people are coming to the class, but the atmosphere is such that it, it's accepting. People are accepting. For example, I have a class running right now, which is five women, probably in the last third of their, of their life, and one gentleman who is, you know, probably in his early 60s. So he's one of the younger people in the group. And I thought for a while, whoa, is, how's this going to work out? You know, it's kind of interesting. It's wonderful. We've had two class sessions now, and the feedback he gives to the stories that he's heard is insightful and affirming. And he's gotten some great acknowledgments from the stories that he has read. It it just it just works. Critical comments are not allowed. I don't ever have to say anything about that or remind people about not saying critical comments. It just happens. It's outlined in that the goals and guidelines that we go through at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I've never had a situation where I've had to privately talk with someone about acceptance or about um, an attitude. It, people are just accepting of differences. And, and, and if I see that there are, you know, obviously if I see that there are some very um, polar opposite personalities in a class, I will be aware of that. I will steer conversation in a positive direction. But people understand and, and that it's okay. We are here to share personal views and experiences. We are not here in any way to judge. So just become safe. People remark about that. I just, I feel so safe here. You know, mm. Thank you, Heidi. You have created such a safe environment. And I think it's unique. I think it's a really unique setting. That's really interesting. So it sounds like that they're treating other people the way they would like to be treated. Absolutely. And I think they know that. I mean, I think they know that their positive feedback 
is going to be reciprocated with positive feedback to them. Beyond that fear, I think what takes over, and here's where the teacher in me comes out, I think they enjoy learning about other people's stories. I mean, that's what I, that's what I try to focus on and highlight is we are learning six different unique perspectives on individual life histories, whether they've occurred in poverty or in great wealth, whether they've occurred under a loving home or a totally dysfunctional home, whether they've occurred in cultural chaos or in cultural stability. We're learning about other people's lives, and that is fascinating. So I think the personal fear of not agreeing with someone or having differences goes away because you're learning. And where learning happens, there's power there. So what are people's motivations when they sign up for your classes? Do they do it because they're interested or on a whim? or They're pretty varied. And I, um, that's one thing that I ask. Um, they fill out a personal, just a, a informational piece at the first session. And one of the questions I ask, and this is for my eyes only, is why, what motivated you to take this class? And the reasons are varied. Some are because people have events in their life that they need to process. They plan their writing, not for anyone else's eyes, but for their own. Some people live far away from their children and grandchildren, and they they say, my grandchildren are not going to know me, and I want them to know who I am. So I'm writing this so my grandchildren will know more about me. Um, Some are writing because their family members have requested it. Other people are writing because they feel their life story is interesting and they want to publish. Some people want to go further and perhaps pursue a public publication. Some are writing to share with the community, with local historical societies. It's it's really varied. Some people just like to write. Many people come to this class who have already written. I have had people in my classes who have published books, have PhDs, um, have been college English professors, and they're taking my class simply because they want a low-key approach to just writing their own stories. They want to focus on themselves and writing the things that have the incidences and the occurrences that have been unique in their life. I have, I have housewives who have never picked up a pen to write before. It, 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 the spectrum is really wide about why they take the class and who takes the class. So despite wanting to write about themselves and take a low-key approach to it, I wonder whether your participants actually understand the importance of having someone listen to their story. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people who sit at home and try to write their memoir, but it sounds like that the story catcher process one that makes a big difference. I think that's something that they come to realise. I don't think anyone comes to class because of the group aspect. But I think very shortly they realize that, wow, there is power in being heard by somebody else. Some, I think, come because they do want to hear other people's stories. But I have not ever heard someone coming to class because they want to read their story to somebody else, because they want somebody else to hear it. I People come because they want to get their stories on paper, and some do say, because I'm interested in hearing other people's stories, but I think they discover in class that wonderful feeling that comes when they are heard and acknowledged by others. I think that's a discovery thing that happens along the way. It's a very personal thing, reading out your own story. Absolutely. I can see in some people They're very nervous, um, especially that first time when we read. They come very much like that young child coming to school for the first time, (laughs) kind of looking around, you know, what's, you know, what, what did your homework turn out like? Or what's in your lunchbox today? Mm. (laughs) They often take a deep breath before they start into their story. Okay, here goes. 
And where do the best stories come from? Are they written by those college professors or those who have never written before? Listeners Heidi talks about which participants get the best story out of themselves. I have some participants who, before they read, they give a multitude of excuses and this was really hard and you're not going to like my story and, and oh, this is really, you know, I, I'm just not a good writer. And invariably, that particular piece that they've written ends up being one of their best. <laughs> this might be kind of a little, a little side shoot here, but I have found that when people have really, really struggled with a theme, that often produces their best writing. It's like, wow, you nailed this. And wow, you just, you captured an amazing story. So there's, I don't think people realize that either. There's an amazing amount of, of deep reflection and, and struggle that comes with wrestling with some of the themes Dr. Biren has um, in his course one. And then of course, if we go on to course two and three, um, we get into other themes that promote that same kind of thinking. So what kind of stories do people write about? I, I, it never ceases to amaze me what, what people come up with. I've had stories of people who have spent time in jail. I've had stories of people who have gone on amazing trips, stories of how people have met the love of their life, the triumphs and heartaches of raising children. People talk about career paths and many different directions their pursuit of a career may have taken them. People write about their service to our country in serving the military. They write about funny little situations, you know, very small occurrences. That she gets participants to write it all is a great achievement. So I wondered what technique and advice Heidi gives participants to even start writing any story. I, I do try to get them to focus on a particular event. This isn't about making a long list of all the things you've done or a long list of all the things that you've done with your significant other throughout your life. It's capture the essence of your relationship in story. Talk about one specific event. And so people do talk about a very specific event, you know, whether it was that outrageous party on the beach when they were in college, or whether it was a time that they needed to get away and they went into solitude, or family celebrations. It, it goes everywhere. So does writing and sharing stories give people confidence that, to then share their story with their family? Because you mentioned at the beginning of our discussion that some people wanted to write for themselves and some people wanted to write for their family. But did they end up getting more confidence through this process? That's a really good question too because, yes, they do. I have had several people who they really are only writing for themselves. I think they just want to spend time reflecting, but I'm not going to share these. I think a lot of people are afraid that their children won't find their stories interesting. And so it's not unusual for people to write their stories. And then after eight weeks, you know, I will ask them, have, have you shared these stories with your children? No, not yet. I think it's easier sometimes for them to share these stories with a group of strangers than it is to share some of these stories with their own family members. Isn't it funny how that works out? I find it fascinating. But there's, again, there's both ends of the spectrum. There are people who share every story they write with their spouse or with their children every week. And their children are saying, Mom, we can't wait till we get your, your next story. Or Dad, we can't wait, wait till we get your next story. Or on the other hand, the people who are really afraid or even say, well, yeah, I showed it to my kids and I don't think they've read them yet. The people most interested or more interested often are the grandchildren. They'll have a big smile and they say, yeah, my granddaughter can't wait for the next story or my grandson is really urging me to write. I find that sometimes grandchildren are more excited about the stories of their grandparents than perhaps the children are. Maybe the children have heard the stories lots of times. 
and the grandchildren haven't had them at all. Perhaps, or perhaps the the children are closer to the source. They're not as far removed from whatever emotion that that story might bring out. I'm not sure, but it's interesting. I have heard people say that their children make comments like, wow, mom, your writing is really improving, Mm. or you're writing a lot better than what you used to. And that is encouraging too. They definitely see an improvement in the quality of their writing, which, of course, the more you write, the better you're going, you know, it's going to improve. So how do participants react after they hear their own memoir? I mean, they've written their memoir, they've read it out at the end of the course structure that you've got, they've written a lot about their life story. What kind of reaction do they have when they realize and reflect on what's happened? We talk a little bit about that towards the end of the class. And it's not uncommon for me to hear comments like, I've really never thought about it in that way. I understand my sister better now that I've written about it. I think writing about it helps them to see a different perspective than perhaps the one they have had all their life. If they write from their perspective, I think they are more inclined to understand that a family member or a friend may have experienced a different perspective, and I think they have more compassion and understanding about that. I really, I've seen some lightening up. I have seen people come into class really quite agitated and bound up by past experiences. Mm. And after one or two of eight-week sessions, they've really loosened up on their attitudes about some of the um, strong emotions and feelings that they previously had. And they come away with more understanding and compassion towards the other characters in their stories. That's really interesting. Oh, It just made me think how... um... How it's interesting that you have participants who they're more mature and I wonder whether it's a function of age that we reflect and maybe reflection is a necessary part of being human. Uh, You know, I think it can happen at any age, however, because when I taught um, fifth and sixth graders, I did teach a unit on memoir writing and I saw the same things happening in that short memoir unit that I taught in my classroom. Mm. I saw students open up and talk about things that school counselors had not been able to get them to talk about. I saw people accepting other kids in a way that I had never seen students accept each other. I don't think it's a generational or an age-related thing. I think story sharing can happen and is powerful at any age. Mm. School is a scary school is a scary thing, <laughs> and there's a lot going on for those, um, especially between the ages of ten and eighteen. There's a lot of stuff going on in school, and when someone can sit back and write stories and feel safe and acknowledged in a positive way by other peers, mm-hmm. there's power in that. I'm not, and, but you have to be careful to create the right environment for that. I think story sharing is powerful at any age. Well, it sounds like that's true from what you're saying, that people need to know that other people are there with the same positive attitude. I guess at that age, having lived a fairly eventful life, that your participants have a lot of stories. There's never a shortage. Once or twice I have had someone say, I don't know if I have any more stories to write. And we do some talking and, you know, we'll we'll just do some sharing and and I'll ask some probing questions. And I go, well, that's a story. Oh, but really? Yes, absolutely. That's a story. And I see their eyes light up and there's a little twinkle in their eye. and, And the next week they come with a story and they go, you know, it really is kind of a neat story. Never thought of that as being a story. But you, I think someone can take something that they may have thought is the most mundane activity and turn it into a story and realize that, wow, I've got some pretty cool things that I can write about. It doesn't have to be grandiose. 
something as simple as picking strawberries on a, a crisp, cool, dewy morning in June. That can be a story. People find joy in recognizing that, oh, I do have some fun things to write about. I've had a pretty cool life. <laughs> and a lot of times, another thing that I see often is it opens up communication between family members. Some, a lot of my students or, or participants will call up their siblings and go, hey, do you remember? And, and what, how do you remember this happening? And I've heard spouses of some of my participants say, yeah, every week now they're on the phone with, with their brother back in the Midwest and they're talking about this and they're on the phone for over an hour talking about stories. So I've seen communication open up between family members as my participants are trying to get details from some of those events in their past. That's been kind of fun to observe too. In your class, you talk about the prompts and then the participant story and then come back the following week and share it. Is that the way it works? Yes. So that gives them time to get on the phone to their brother <laughs> to figure out the details of the story. They have a week to process. It's like a homework assignment. That story kind of percolates in their mind for a week. And many times they write that story the day before class, but they've had a week to think about it. And some people say, I wake up in the middle of the night and I have a piece of paper next to my bed because I remember that I've got to put this in my story. <laughs> I have to put this detail in my story. And then the next week, the theme is completely different. Their mind goes in a completely different direction. The class is only eight weeks long. They do realize that every theme has a multitude of stories. So they can go back after class is over and revisit the themes and, and say, okay, now I'm going to pick up on this other story related to branching points or some of the other themes that are presented. Right. So I think I understand now why people trying to write memoir on their own at home, why they get stuck. They need a story catcher. They need a group. Yeah. And, and many people who start stories on their own have this notion that they have to tell their life story chronologically. And I, I hear that all the time. Well, I've, I've already written one book on, on my life. But it peters out. It starts to peter out right around the age. They get to the age of their 20s. And they run out of gas on their stories. And I hear often, wow, I never thought about writing my life stories in a way other than chronologically. And they really appreciate that. They appreciate taking a theme approach as opposed to a chronological approach. Heidi has explained that participants have up to seven or eight stories after completing each of her GAB classes. But she doesn't have just one class. People can take her class two or three times. So let's listen to Heidi explain what people do with their stories after they've completed these classes. When students come to my course three, they have a collection of 15 stories. And at the beginning of my course three, then we talk about how would we then organize this collection of stories. And then they can begin to see if some of the stories have commonalities or do they want to um, organize their stories by seasons. You know, these are, these are stories about the spring of my life or the summer of my life. Um, or do they want to organize their stories by the hills, the valleys, the deserts, the plains, the mountaintops? Maybe they can see some different um, aspects of takeaways in their stories that would fit into an organizational strategy. Sometimes the approach of themes versus chronologically, people go, well, then I've got a random collection of stories. Well, not really. You know, we can, tie, we can sew them together with a thread by recognizing how can these fit together. And we, we get to that by course three. In course three, do people make books then? Is that where they start publishing? 
it's where they learn how to how what they can do to start publishing. Okay. Course three, we extend the writing craft skills. We look at organization. We read and compare other published memoirs. And then we do look at what it takes to to publish, whether it's personal, local, or public publishing. Mm -hmm. I am not a publisher, though. I just let them know. And I do have a, a professional publisher who comes to the class as a guest speaker. They just learn about what what's the path to publishing. So what's one of the most popular topics that uh, your participants write about? Is there one topic that you know will get people going? I would say there might, as, as students get into my course too, some of the more popular themes are values, life values. People do want to talk about what the values are that they have found important and useful in life. So that that becomes an you know a popular topic. Sometimes people want to write about their greatest achievements. They talk about something that they're proud of in their life. I think I can see why life values is fairly important for people to talk about. Why a lot of people would gravitate towards doing that. Yes. And it it's quite amazing. I've had probably well over 150 participants in the last 3 years. And I could probably narrow it down to six basic life values that comes out from most people. <laughs> They're pretty basic. And, and even though there's been such a huge variation in life paths that people have traveled, the values do boil down to very few. It sounds like it's a lesson that we're more connected as humans than we realize. Oh, yes, exactly. I think that's what makes me love doing this so much is I am learning so much about humanity. It's just exciting. I am energized after every single class because I am learning a little bit more about how humanity in, in two ways, how incredibly diverse we are, but yet how incredibly similar we are. Just like you just said, exactly. So I wonder if people who come to your class not wanting to publish their memoirs do they end up changing their mind and want to publish their memoirs, at least in a way that gives it broader distribution, perhaps to their family and friends? I think so. They, they become more confident and they are more, um, they recognize that people have been interested in hearing their stories and they're like, oh, I can do this. <laughs> yeah, this is kind of fun. I really don't, there aren't many people who want to take it public though. And I think that's a pretty limited population of someone who can take their memoir and turn it into a bestseller. I think I have students who could do that. I have had incredible writers, and I know they could take it to the next level, but that's a really long journey, and I think you need to be really persistent in doing that. But that's not what your classes are for, though, are they? Not at all. I mean, many people, they, I mean, they're, they're enjoying life, they're enjoying travel and their children and their grandchildren, and they're dealing with medical issues. And they're not at a point in their life where they want to tackle that next mountain, <laughs> which publishing for public distribution would be a, a challenging journey. So Heidi, what advice would you give people who might be considering writing aspects of their life story down, but they haven't started yet? I would say just consider starting very small. Just take one small topic and write a two-page story on that topic. It, the thought of writing your life stories is an incredibly daunting thought because it's taken you 50, 60 years to live this life. And putting it in story, are you kidding? But just consider a very small aspect of your life. Think about one event that happened, one conversation you had, one meaningful gift that you were given, one meaningful encounter 
you experienced with another person, a lecture you attended, a goal you set out to accomplish and you and you accomplished it. Take one small thing and write a two-page story on it. And I think you're going to be really surprised with how it turns out. That's a great advice. I asked Heidi what story of hers that she had written was her favorite. One of my favorite stories that I've written for myself when I took this class with Cheryl through the Beeren Institute, I captured a story about the times that my dad read me bedtime stories. That story brought such joy to my parents. But it was so fun for me to write because I put myself back in that old farmhouse in Michigan with lavender paint on the walls and beautiful white lace curtains and my dad sitting beside me reading bedtime stories every night. And I was back there in that place as a five, six, seven-year-old child. And it was such a wonderful story to write. Just a small thing, just writing about dad reading bedtime stories to me every every night. That sounds like a nice memory too. Can I ask you a question about technology? Do people write their stories with pencil and paper or do they use computers? I've had both. Some people write their stories in their own writing and some use computers. Some people don't have computers and so they write them, they write their stories out. On paper and pencil. So it's just what you're used to, really, isn't it? It is. And I haven't had this yet, but if someone needed to, they could also just record their story. If their printer wasn't working or something happened to their story, they will tell their two-page story in class. But you can capture a story also by saying it and having somebody else record it. Right, like a tape recorder, digital recorder. Absolutely. Okay. Heidi, where is your business located and what geographical locations do you cover? I live in Washington State and I live just across the water. I'm a ferry ride across the water from Seattle on the Kitsap Peninsula. People have traveled oh, as far as 45 minutes away to get to my class. I hold the classes in my home. Maximum participants is six. What city are you in? We're just off of Bainbridge Island in, it's a small Norwegian town, it's Polsbo. Heidi, can you tell us how the audience can connect with you after your show? Like, let, let's know about your website. My website is T-Y-E Memoirs, which stands for Through Your Eyes Memoirs, with an S, dot com. Excellent. And I also, I have had a number of requests for people to take my class online. They've heard about it through a family member or a friend, but they live perhaps somewhere else in the country. And I've had people um, email me, um, contact me through my website and say, do you offer online classes? And at this point, I have not, but I am open to offering online classes and Um, I have a waiting list of of three or four people, and if I have other requests, I might just do this class online. Mm, So for that, a participant would definitely need access to a computer. Yes, access to a computer, definitely, and also um, just working through some familiarity with conferencing software. Heidi, I really appreciate you being on Storical today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. It's been a pleasure talking with you. I've enjoyed meeting you, and thank you for what you're doing to promote story sharing. Thank you. It's a wonderful endeavor. Thanks. This was our second episode on guided autobiography, and I hope you enjoyed Heidi's advice, especially on how to start by starting small. Thank you for joining me in another episode of Storical. Feel free to let me know how you like Storical, either on iTunes or where you get your podcasts. Or you can email me, peter, P-E-T-A, at storical, S-T-O-R-Y-I-C-A-L, dot com. Come to our website at lifestoryprofessionals.com 
To get more information about the episode you heard today, the website has free downloadable tips and links and books that people on our show have written. May Historical inspire you to story the historical because it's never too soon to get started, but often it can be too late.